What's up, y'all? I'm Will here with Schedule Fly, and this is the Restaurant Owners Uncorked podcast, one of the highest rated hospitality podcasts in the world, brought to you by us at Schedule Fly. We provide a very simple web based restaurant employee scheduling software backed by legendary customer service. If you're on pencil and paper or Excel, or you're on some software with tons of bells and whistles and features you don't need or use, ScheduleFly is the perfect place for you. Easy to use, point, click, and go, and we'll take great care of you. ScheduleFly.com, free trial, check it out. Also, this podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Pop Menu and The Giving Kitchen and KickFin. And you're going to hear about them in just a minute. First of all, let's talk about today's guest. Today's guest is Tom Holland. And Tom owns restaurants up in the Boston area. I wanted to talk to Tom because I saw on his website, uh, one of his places is called A&B Burgers. And the story on there talks about how the name A&B comes from the initials um, of his son's names. And I thought, well, that's, that's probably a cool story. Um, I'd love to learn more. Little did I know that over 500 episodes on this podcast, this one ranks easily top five in terms of how powerful and emotional this story is. I thought I was going to cry probably during the episode. This dude is a hero, and I'm not going to spoil his story. You need to hear it, but this is an incredible episode, highly memorable, one I'll never forget. We'll definitely have Tom on here again. Huge honor to be able to share this story. And y'all, this is why we do what we do with this podcast. This is an independent restaurant owner, doesn't have a platform to share this story, but what a powerful story it is. So we're grateful and we're honored to have this opportunity. You're going to love this episode. Thank you all so much for watching and listening. More episodes coming soon. Enjoy. The busiest time of year is coming. Is your staff ready for the holiday rush? This year, give your team the gift of Pop Menu AI Answering, a simple solution for phones ringing off the hook. AI Answering handles calls 24-7, 365 days a year, so your staff can focus on in-person guests. Customize your greetings and responses, answer common questions, promote specials and events, and send follow-up links to ordering and reservations. AI Answering handles it all, while escalating more complex conversations back to your team. Never miss another tasty revenue opportunity. Pop Menu, the marketing technology platform designed to make growing your restaurant easy. Discover more AI restaurant tools that turn your to-do list into an already done list by requesting a demo today. For a limited time, get $100 off your first month, plus lock in one unchanging monthly rate at popmenu.com. Go now to get $100 off your first month at popmenu.com. Be sure to tell them that Will from Restaurant Owners Uncorked podcast and Schedule Fly sent you. Y'all, this is a great business. I just told you what they like me to say. I will say that we have a lot of mutual customers at Schedule Fly with Pop Menu. They all agree. Great product, great customer service, great results. Check them out, popmenu.com. This episode is also brought to you by The Giving Kitchen. Giving Kitchen provides emergency assistance for food service workers through financial support and a network of community resources. Since its inception in 2013, Giving Kitchen has served over 15,000 food service workers and awarded over $10.5 million to food service workers in crisis. If you or someone you know is a food service worker in crisis, please ask for help. TheGivingKitchen.org, and again, that's thegivingkitchen.org. Y'all, this is a phenomenal organization. Jen, the founder, has been on this podcast. Jen Heidinger Kendrick, check out that episode to hear their full story. But if you know somebody or you need help, go to thegivingkitchen.org. Incredible, incredible organization and very responsive and has a wonderful mission. Check them out. All right, so here we are live uh, with the Restaurant Owners Uncorked podcast, and I've got my buddy Tom up in Boston on here today. Tom, introduce yourself. Yeah, how you doing, man? Well, uh, Tom Holland. I am the owner of a Burgers in Beverly, Massachusetts, as well as a Kitchen and Bar uh, in Boston on Causeway Street. 
All right, man. First question, always first question, how, when, and why did you get started in the hospitality business? Oh man, that is a very deep question, man. I, I don't know. Uh, it's, it, it's a long story and we, we can get into it, I guess. But, uh, I started in as a bus boy in 1989 uh, at a restaurant called the Roadhouse Cafe in Hyannis, Mass, in Cape Cod. Uh, you know, I didn't I didn't go to high school. I didn't go to I, I left home when I was 15, and so that was the first job I got. You know, and uh, and I realized I loved it, and I just kept doing more and more. I used it as an opportunity to be able to travel. I traveled all over the world. I was able to work and make money, spend time in different cities. Uh, and then one day I realized this is my life and, and I do it and I'm good at it. And so I decided to turn into a career and uh, got into restaurant ownership. Wow. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, brother. I'm telling okay. you, I could so... go, we could go back. Uh, we got, we got a lot to talk about if you want to really hear the story. Uh, well, well so, I mean, so you started like how did busing tables lead to traveling all over the, the well, world like, what happened so when i was 15 years old i was living in cape cod and i decided that the life of going to school and doing what everybody said wasn't for me and so um at 15 i jumped on the highway i stuck out my thumb and i hitchhiked to san francisco um holy God. yeah yeah i knew nobody i just went i had 10, 15 15 i had a, a, a like a backpack a school backpack and i just had a couple change of clothes ten dollars that was it uh and a carton of cigarettes because back then i smoked uh and uh and i hit the road and i went to san francisco i was an old deadhead i followed the grateful dead around the country for four years uh, I saw almost 300 shows, and uh, when I was 19, you know, I realized that all my friends around me were either dying or going to jail, and I didn't want that to happen to me. And so I, I went home, and uh, I got my first job as a busboy. Uh, and that, you know, so I've always been that kind of guy that I, I've never been a structured guy. I've always been a guy who loves interacting and i love new adventures and that's what the restaurant is right like you're meeting new people every day you have new problems every day you have new successes every day you never walk into the restaurant and think this is going to be a routine day because they just don't happen uh yeah and and that's me and that's my personality uh you know so then i was i i, I were i met a, a friend uh dude in, in this restaurant in cape cod and he convinced me to buy a motorcycle and uh ride my motorcycle across country with him and i did and two of us rode our bikes across country back to san francisco and i ended up getting my first waiter job there uh you know and then just kind of why i loved waiting tables i loved bartending uh i loved just the excitement of it all i was a nightlife person you know at the time there was a lot of uh, the, the industry was very different than it is today um a lot of partying. Uh, I I got involved in a lot of bad stuff, and I I ended up becoming, you know, a, a, I I ended up becoming homeless. I became a drug addict and an alcoholic in the industry. Um, I ended up losing everything. I was living on the streets um, for a number of years and bounced around. I was unemployable, and then when I was thirty in two thousand one. I decided I had enough. I went into a halfway house. Uh, I got sober. I've been sober for 22 and a half years. Mm. And uh, and in that halfway house, uh, I got a job as a waiter just to make money. And I was going to go to school for journalism. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a, a wartime journalist. I wanted to go off into in you know into wherever there was conflict and be able to go. That was that was my dream. Uh, and I started waiting tables at this place called Sansi on Newberry Street in Boston, super famous restaurant. And, uh, and I never left. <laughs> I ended up becoming a brunch manager and then a, a, a restaurant manager and then an assistant general manager and then the general manager. I was there for eight years. I never went to school uh, because I loved the business so much. And, uh, you know, and that, that just started my journey towards ownership. Uh, you know, so, so it was, uh, it was the, the industry was 
first for me because it allowed me freedom and un- I didn't have structure. Then it became a necessity because it was the only thing I knew how to do. And then it became my passion because I realized I don't want to do anything else. I love this industry. And, uh, you know, I worked when I became partners. Well, first director of operations, then a business partner with Michael Schlau, who's, you know, world famous chef, great owned restaurants from D.C. to Michigan, Boston. Amazing dude. Taught me a ton. Uh, What's his name? Michael Schlau. Uh, he owns the Schlau Restaurant Group, and they have, you know, they own Radius and Biamata in Boston, which are two of the, you know, they're both gone now. Uh, when 2008 hit and the bank crisis, the you know, we were very, very upscale in those restaurants. You know, they were tasting menus and high prices and, and uh, dining changed. And so those restaurants uh, didn't quite fit with the diners anymore. Uh but he has Alta Stratos in D.C., Virginia, um, at Foxwoods, uh, Wellesley, Mass. He's got a few, few uh, sushi places. He's got he's got a whole different yeah. realm of restaurants. Anyways, he was he's a great chef, and he taught me a ton. And I was able to turn that ownership, that partnership, into my own restaurants. Uh, and ten years ago, I opened A and B Burgers in Salem, Mass. Uh, and it's been a ten year journey ever since for me. A and B burgers and tell us why it's named A and B. A and B are actually my sons, Alex and Ben. So, um, you know, when I left, <laughs> it's funny to say it out loud now because, you know, at the time I thought this, but uh, when I left, I was working with my, I was working 24 hours a day, man. When my son Alex was born, I took one day off and then I was back to work. You know, that was it. I took his day of birth off and I was back to work and I said, you know what? I want to do this differently and I'm going to open my own place. and I'm going to have more time for my family. And so I named it after my kids. Cause that's why I was doing this. Uh, you know, little did I know that when you're the only person, <laughs> you work way more and uh, you see way less of them than when you are uh, working for somebody else or, or have a team around you. So it took me a while before I got to spend that time with those kids, but, but it can't. Well, I asked that because that's what really caught my attention when I, I went to your website and saw what A and B stood for and saw their awesome pictures on there. And yeah. Dude. God, I mean, dude, this might have to be a whole series. I have a thousand <laughs> questions I want to ask. I mean, because you went from leaving home at 15, all of those issues for all of those years, for the you know for the next 15 years, and here you are now – Um, you know, the industry that enabled you to, you know, pretty much bring your life and bring you to your knees essentially has now enabled you to have a successful business. And that's quite an amazing turn. And that's one of the interesting things about this industry. The industry has shifted a lot over the years. The culture has changed. It used to be that work hard, play hard, Mm -hmm. lots of substance abuse, lots of partying, um, lots of people that wound up in in the same situation as you, homeless, streets, strung out on drugs and alcohol, jail. Uh, The industry, I think, collectively has has started to shift and understand that, you know, that doesn't have to be part of the culture to still have a fun and thriving culture. In fact, it's, it needs to not be to have a sustainable, fun and thriving culture and a successful business. And, uh, but it's a challenging thing because you're also, that's part of the industry, you know, it, mm-hmm. it's fun and partying is what the industry wants people to experience. And alcohol is certainly a huge part of that. I congratulate you on, okay. um, you know, that commitment you made 22 and a half years ago and sticking to that, man. So, um, what a phenomenal life-changing, drastically life-changing moment for you. And now you own business and you have, you have a family, dude, that's powerful stuff. (laughs) Thank you, man. Thank you. You know, it is, it was, I was the first person in this halfway house they ever allowed to work in a restaurant or a bar setting because people are trying to get sober. 
Um, but it was all I knew. It was all I knew. And they trusted me and they let me do it. Um, and mainly because they knew I was going to go back to it. So I had to learn how to maneuver my new lifestyle, for lack of a better term, uh, within an industry that, uh, you know, I had, yeah, it gave me tons of opportunities to, to mess up, so to speak. Um, and it, it, you know, yeah, the industry has definitely changed. It is way different. You know, people are just different and society's changed. Um, but the thing that I always saw with me and with my sobriety was, you know, that, so this place, Sonsi, if you ever look it up, it's S O N S I E. It's on Newberry street, which is called like the Rodeo drive of Boston. It's been there since 1994. Um, Sincros, the Boston celebrity playground when I was there, you know, like Tom Brady lived next door and Matt Damon and Ben Affleck own, you know, bought us out for their, their New Year's Eve party. Like there was just, it was that kind of place. And it was all, it was called the place to see and be seen. They had these doors that opened up right to Newberry street and it, all the beautiful people sat out front and they would sit there five o'clock, six o'clock on a summer night, drinking champagne and smoking cigarettes. Cause you could smoke in restaurants then. And it made me, it was hard for me to watch, you know, it was hard for me to be around cause they looked so beautiful doing everything they were doing. But then I saw those same people at one and two o'clock in the morning. And that honestly, that is what kept me sober at the beginning was I saw all these people change. They allowed the night change them and they got ugly. And I ended up having to get, I got in fights as a manager trying to get, you know, I'd cut somebody off and they'd hit me or they'd want to fight me or, you know, somebody, I found people passed out in the bathroom on the floor when I'm locking up an hour and a half after we closed because they went to their bathroom and their friends left them. And as I do my walkthrough before I leave the restaurant, I would literally find people passed out on the floor of the bathroom and those things. And those are the things that got me through that, that early days being in this industry and trying to change my life was that I saw it from the beginning to the end. Yeah. Everyone looked sexy and beautiful and the sun was out and they were all, you know, sipping champagne and wine and martinis, but they did not, have that same look at two o'clock in the morning you know uh god yeah it was it was very different so that really empowered me a bit you know and that got me through it and you know and also this is very important and this isn't a story about surprise story about restaurant ownership but it is part of my story and you know you get when you make that decision and you keep that decision it just becomes more solid and the better things that happen to me in life the more I wanted to keep it. And so I was, you know, and that's what A and B stands for. That's what my boys are. The best things that ever happened to me, including my wife, uh, Nancy, best things that ever happened to me. And so it's a daily reminder when I come into my restaurants, of what I have to lose, what I have to work for, uh, you know, why I'm doing this every single day as I walk in and I look and I see my family's name on the front. And it's a, it's a pretty motivating, uh, you know, moment when I see that it's like, sometimes you wonder what the hell are you doing all this stuff for? <laughs> Cause it's not easy, especially the last three years, man. But then I think about it. I'm like, you know what? I'm doing this so that my sons have a better life. You know, my family can, can enjoy themselves and I can take great care of people that, you know, come to me and, and choose me uh, to host them. You know, that's pretty cool. Dude. It's phenomenal, man. This is like the hero's journey, Tom. I mean, the, you know, uh, wanting something and having to achieve significant obstacles and overcome those obstacles to get it. I mean, you went from, you don't have to get into your childhood, but you, you left home at 15. I can infer some things. And then now yeah. <laughs> here you are, I'm assuming you drew inspiration and strength from saying, okay, you know, we either learn what we want or what we don't want or both. I mean, you said, okay, I don't want that. Now you've, you've given your family what you clearly didn't have. And you're a, a, a yeah. you know, you're, Oh yeah. Uh, you've, you've given these boys something that, that you needed and didn't have. And what an amazing turn of events. And you know, the, um, I mean, I, I've got three kids. I talk to my kids about this stuff. Like I'm like, look, you know, like the things that, the things that 
that like substance abuse or not su- not substance abuse substance use it's cool for a moment it feels good it's like things that feel good for a short period of time will will lead to bad things for a long period of time like just like you were talking about like hey yeah great yeah it feels good at first and you're out there having fun the next thing you know you're you're getting in a fight or you're getting thrown in jail or you're getting a DUI or you feel crappy for the next five days because you ever did it. And it's like short, good, long, bad, you know, versus like, I don't know, like you need to get fired up. Like, go. I mean, I always like I go I go take a cold shower, <laughs> you know, short, yeah, yeah, bad, yeah. <laughs> then you feel good for a long time. Like, but t- to that point, like what I mean, look, you followed the dead. You got in all kinds of stuff. What do you do? You had to have made some replacement, I've got to imagine, for, you know, using substances. Like, what did you do to, I don't get your fix or whatever you want to call it now. Like, do you meditate, pray, exercise, like, or is it just the work? No, well, so that's a really good, at the end there, where I did at the beginning, it was all work. I replaced everything I thought that was negative in my life was something I thought would be positive, which was just put everything into work, you know? And mm-hmm. and that was my life. Like my wife, she is a saint. She's been with me, you know, we met, I was maybe eight months sober and we've been together and, you know, so she's never knew me prior to that, but she's been with me through this entire journey. And being in this industry, I never had a weekend off. I never had a Friday, a Saturday. I didn't want time off. I I knew like this was what I needed. And, you know, I, I my family, I, best man at my weddings, my buddy Timmy, used to go to all my family events with my wife. And they would call him Stand In Tom because they knew I wasn't going to be there, you know, but she didn't want to go alone. And, you know, he was my best friend. So he would, you know, he would go there with Stand In Tom. Um, and but then I started realizing that I had, you know, the reason I got sober was to find a better balance to life, right? Like, you know, I, I, I don't I wasn't trading an addiction of substance for an addiction of work. I needed to find happiness within, right? Mm-hmm. Like happiness here. And you did, you mentioned prayer. Like I'm I'm a spiritual dude. I I believe in God. I talk to him every day. Um, it's, it's something that's important to me. Um, I don't put that on other people. Everybody has their own feelings, their own thoughts and beliefs, but that that gets me through the day. Prayer to me is more of like, it is meditation. I, you know, I get down on my knees. I humble myself before God. I think about, you know, my day, I talk about ways I, I, I should have been better this day. I could have been better today, you know, and I just I use it as a as a moment of reflection. And then I'm boom, gone, go. And that's my day. That's how I start. You know, I'm pretty balanced now. You know, I don't work like I used to. Have. Right now I'm working a lot because I made changes and I changed GMs at both restaurants. So I'm here all the time again but that's good you know like getting back in here other times you know i might work two nights a week but i'm here i'm here all day Mm. in my office you know doing my work isn't as fun anymore you know like the restaurant industry to me i love being behind the bar mixing drinks talking to guests out my days are spent answering emails and going through spreadsheets and coding invoices and you know, that's the majority of my day now. So, uh, you know, that's the business owner side of it. So I still try to make sure that I get here to do the fun stuff, which is seeing my guests and my regulars and motivating my staff and all of that. But I'm not doing it like I used to, which was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, you know, my sons are 11 and 14 now. So, uh, you know, when we started this, they were at one and four. Um, so I, you know, I, I want to be a part of, like I, I said, I travel a lot during, you know, every summer, my sons are baseball players, my 14 year old and I take road, you know, last summer we we're on the road for five weeks, uh, you know, going down to Florida and Virginia and Maryland and South Carolina playing, playing ball. And it was awesome. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to do that if I wasn't in this industry and didn't own my own businesses, you know, so, so what, 
took years of just putting a hundred percent of me into every moment has now paid benefits because I'm able to balance family and life and work, I should say. All right, y'all. It is time for a little mid-episode break. We're going to talk about Kickfin. Thousands of restaurants, bars, and breweries use Kickfin to tip out their employees instantly. No cash required. With Kickfin, tips go directly to your employees' bank of choice the second their shift ends. It's a really simple solution to a really big problem because if you're still paying out credit card tips in cash, it's costing you. Time-consuming bank runs and cash counting take managers away from work that matters. Cash is hard to track, which leads to accounting headaches, and it creates the perfect opportunity for theft, human error, and compliance issues. Bottom line, there's never been an instant secure way to pay out tips until KickFin. It's an easy-to-use software that sends real-time, cashless tip payouts straight to your employees' bank accounts, 24-7, 365. KickFin gives managers hours back in their day, makes reporting a breeze, and protects your business from risk. Most importantly, employees love it. Restaurants can have KickFin up and running overnight. Employees can roll in seconds. No hardware, no contracts, no setup fees. Visit kickfin.com for a personalized demo. See how restaurants across the country are digitizing tips with KickFin. All right, that's what they asked me to say. So I say it, and it tells the story very well, but I like to add this in. We referred a customer that we know and love very well, Sup Dogs, to KickFin. Sup Dogs has been a customer for a super long time. Trust them very much with their opinion on these types of tools. They started using KickFin. I asked Brett, the owner, recently how it's going. He said, KickFin is perfect. It's going great. Exactly what we were hoping for. So there you go. KickFin.com, y'all. Check them out. You're a guy that's going to get after it, whatever it is you're doing, uh, and pour yourself into it. That's that's clear. Uh, as a young man, that was partying. Um, yep. And when you got through that phase, it was it was it was working. And um, we get to a point in life. I, I'm very much the same. We're probably roughly about the same age. I'm 49, but you start to realize, like, I gotta. I'm constantly trying to figure out the balance. Like, I defer a lot of times to working too much, like, because I'm like, well, work is something. It's like a easy problem to solve. Like this is the thing that needs to be done. And if I do that and I work, then I'll figure it out versus like, but then you're like, I mean, God, my 16 year old son right now, it's like, I, oh my God, I, I don't, I don't even know how to like, you know, it's just, it, it's like, <laughs> dude, yeah, right. I don't, I'm like it's hard. Uh, but it's, but it is really, I'm glad to hear that you have prayer and you have balance and you have time with your family. I mean, this is what, this is what we do this for, right? You, yeah. Or you found, I think, Tom, what really is important to you, which is like when you're, when you're doing all the party and I, I did a lot of this when I was young too. So I get, it's, it's about your, it's kind of like about yourself, right? Like you're kind of in this, like, I want to have fun. I want this. I want that. And then you kind of mature and you're starting to be like, I don't really want to focus on me. I, I'd like actually like focusing on others, which is what hospitality is. I mean, your, your whole livelihood is about providing some meaningful experience to the people that the guests that come into your restaurants and whether it's because they want to come to mourn a loss, to celebrate a win, to get together with friends they haven't seen or to have a night off of family dinner and bring the family all out. Like it's always about providing this, this experience for, for others. So it's externally facing and it's, it's a more rewarding way to be right when you're focused on others and and not you know just on me and what I want that, because the byproduct of focusing on others and helping others and doing for others and focusing on God and and focusing on family is the byproduct is you are you actually are happier and more fulfilled from that because of you're not focused on you you know what I mean no I I 100% agree with you uh, you know I mean it, it one of the most rewarding parts of this business is that you know somebody who's like for me having these for 10 years now i have regulars that not only have my kids grown up in this restaurant but so have my guests you know and so like i've watched these families that started coming to, to a and b 
10, nine, 10 years ago. And now their kids, they're coming, you know, they came last week because their kids came home from college for the holiday and they come out to dinner because A and B is their spot, right? Like that's been their family spot. And so it's, it's really cool to be that place that, and, and to be in the opportunity that you're able to build those relationships. And, and as you said, you know, mourning a loss or, or celebrating a, a win or just going out on a Friday night, you know, it's like people can choose where to go. They can choose thousands. There's thousands of restaurants in this area. They go anywhere, but they choose to come to my restaurant. And I believe that's because we, we focus on building relationships, right? Like, relationships are what this industry what what life is all about I tell that to my boys all the time it's like yes education is so important and so is hard work but neither of those are going to get you the success that you that you want without building meaningful and positive relationships you know i wouldn't have these restaurants everybody i didn't come from any money my family didn't have money i was like i said i came from the streets um and it, I met people working in restaurants that I built relationships with. And when I decided that I wanted to go out and do my own thing and I picked up the phone and called them, they trusted me and invested their money in, in me, you know, like, yeah, they bet in the business, but it was in me. And those relationships are, are very important to me. You know, when, when we go through our challenges, I think about three different groups of people. Of course, I think about my family. I think about my employees because they're so important in everything I do. And I think about my, my investors because they trusted me and, and, you know, I, I have a, I owe them every bit of hard work I can. So relationships are, are, are what this industry is about. It's what sobriety is about. It's what life is about. And, uh, you know, I try to teach that to everybody that works for me and, and my kids too, that, if you want to make sh sure that you're going to have here in this restaurant, you're going to have repeat guests. You got to make, take the time to find out who your guests are because they'll come back to you. You know, tell me about your team. My team's amazing. Honestly, they really are. Um, they are work hard. Uh, you know, I am sure everybody you talk to right now, we still haven't got, we still talk about, you know, this is still the, post COVID recovery period, right? Yes. Like we're still not out of it yet. Right. Not even close, not even close. In fact, this year has been harder than 2021 and 2022 because well, nobody has the, the government funding anymore, you know? So we're all struggling harder and harder. My team has been with me fighting through this with me every single day. They, we aren't an easy restaurant. You know, you think A and B burgers, you think it's a burger place, you know, like, well, you're going to get super casual. Nobody really cares about service, hospitality. That's not true. Like, I truly believe that we are in the hospitality industry and it doesn't matter what what style of service or what style of restaurant you own. You know, it can be quick serve. It can be casual. It can be upscale, fine dining. Um, you have to give the same level of hospitality at all of them. Um, you know, quick little side that, that tells you how I train my staff is that, you know, before you know, everybody's got easy pass now, but before easy pass was really a thing and you could just drive through them. We used to have to go through toll booths, right? You have to hand the toll booth collector $2 and leave. And I'd always pull up my wife and I would be in the car and I'd pull up on the mass pike. And I'd, the first thing I do when I pull up, I'm like, Hey, how you doing today? And they would just, regularly just stick their hand out two dollars they wouldn't respond they wouldn't smile they wouldn't do anything and so for the next 20 minutes of me driving down the highway i would just complain to my wife about how it doesn't take that much to smile you could you can you know you're a forward facing hospitality even in a toll booth you're welcoming people right you can make their day you can impact their day and it used to drive me crazy to the point that she went out and found easy path and got me one because she was sick and tired of listening to me <laughs> complain about toba collectors in the car for 20 minutes every time we went on the highway so that's how i drive my team and that's how i train my team is that you come in we we don't have customers we don't say the word customers here 
your guests. Yeah. Customers are transactional, right? Like it's all about the money and this product. That's it. They come in, they give me money. I give them product, they leave. There's nothing. Guests are my family. They're guests. They're people in my house. They're, you know, when you walk into my house, I don't dismiss you and I don't walk away or I don't say, yeah, well, the kitchen's in there. Go grab yourself a drink. I'm going to go head downstairs and do some work. You don't do that, right? Guests come in and I immediately greet them. I hug them. I take their coat for them. I offer them a drink. I cook for them. I make sure that they're great till the second they leave. And that's how we drive this restaurant, how we try to make every person and we don't do we don't succeed every time we are far from perfect but my staff works hard to get there and they really do believe that whether it's a burger restaurant or a and b kitchen is a, a sports bar because right across the street from the boston garden we don't believe that our style and level of hospitality should drop just because we're casual environments um and and they buy into it so i'm, I'm very lucky you know my kitchen team has been with me a long time. Uh, you know, even during COVID when we were shut, forced to be shut down. Uh, you know, I had a number of staff that couldn't collect unemployment for various reasons and they had no income. And so they were, you know, they wouldn't be able to eat. They wouldn't because you couldn't leave your house. Right. So I reached out to some of my investors and we put some money together and, we then reached out to local schools and homeless shelters and found kids that were on the free lunch program that no longer their families no longer could get their kids free lunch and shelters that no longer had people coming in and cook for them. And we put our staff, anybody that wanted to work, I paid them the entire shutdown and they just came in Monday through Friday and we, we made 120 to 150 lunches a day. And we drove around and dropped them off at everyone's front door. And we did that for months through COVID. And that was how we were able to keep our team together. And they've still been, you know, they're still with me now, so, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know, anyone that wanted to work had work, uh, you know, thankfully, which was pretty cool. Mm. Well, you clearly have, you've alluded to this and that story just sealed the deal. You clearly have some, great people that are investors as well. And that's one of the things I've learned over the years of talking to owners like yourself is, you know, you're starting this restaurant and you're getting investors and you just, you just, you need the money and, and you, you know, you just want that check, but be real careful who you bring in as your investors because they do become, they're, they're part of that family and you need investors that, when you go to them during a situation like COVID and say, Hey, look, like, let's do this, that they're going to step up because they're good people. They're not just giving you money and expecting some return. This is what's so amazing to me, man. They're one of the things that's so amazing to me about independent restaurants is you have investors, owners, employees, and regulars and guests that, it's just collectively such a great, like if great group of people, particularly the guests that really understand the importance of independent restaurants because of what you do for your community, what you all do. I mean, you were clearly essential workers. People re recognized intensely, I think, during COVID, how much they really appreciate their local independent restaurants and all that that those folks do for their communities and they didn't want to see them go. Like maybe you kind of took it for granted and then you started to realize like, wait a minute, man, like one of the most important aspects of any great community, big city, small town, somewhere in between, it can't be great in a place where people want to live unless there's a lot of really awesome small businesses and particularly independent restaurants. It's where it's like the, the, the heartbeat, the pulsing heartbeat of any great t city or town. And yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, we had a tough time in Boston because we opened just months before the pandemic shut us down. And I don't know, it was like in Charlotte where you are, but in Boston, everybody left the city, everybody. 
they bought, you know, nobody wanted to live near people, right? You couldn't really go do anything. We were all shut down. Um, you know, my business is there is very, very dependent on the Celtics and Bruins and concerts uh, because we're directly across the street from the garden. And that was all, you know, there were no fans for a year and a half there. So, and we were only months old. So everybody left the city. We, we were shut down for almost a year. There was just no reason to open. We couldn't, we, all our staff went to, came up to Beverly, but what you were saying about community coming together in Beverly was amazing. I mean, when we opened up, reopened it first for just for takeout, we were slammed to the point that I had to like apologize to people for how bad it was because we couldn't keep up. Like everybody wanted to support us. Everybody wanted to come and take care of us. And they, they knew like, let's order out, you know, people had a lot of expendable cash because they couldn't spend their money on anything. So, you know, and they wanted to have a little feeling of normalcy. So they were ordering out and bringing restaurants, food home. Um, and we had to change, shift our whole business model from dine in to takeout, even though, you know, you think A&B Burgers is a, is a, was always a takeout spot. It's not, you know, we were a sit down, full service restaurant, full bar, you know, we, we have $250 shots of tequila. We have $300 bottles of wine. We have charcuteries and, you know, chicken liver mousses and oyster, all kinds of stuff, you know, in addition to burgers. So we didn't have a takeout model. Um, and we had to shift that. And it was because the community wanted to support us so much, uh, you know, and that's, that, that was an amazing thing. You know, it was very, it, it was life-saving for a, a lot of us, you know, um, you know, so we we're very grateful to our guests as well for having that support to help us through, you know, and that's, it's kind of ironic because, you know, I just said it's this year has actually been harder for most restaurants you know, everybody I know anyways, because, you know, it's like, it's not, there isn't that same level of support, like universally and people don't have the kind of money they have now. So they can't dine out like they used to, you know, I mean, everything costs so much more and, and all. And so, you know, with inflation and all this going on, people are very, very particular about where they go. So for us, we have to work 10 times harder to make sure that everybody that comes here enjoys themselves. Uh, they're not as forgiving as they was three years. Rightfully so. Yeah. Rightfully so. Shouldn't be, um, you know, but three years ago, everyone was like, ah, oh, it's COVID. It's okay. Now it's not. <laughs> now right, right. You make a mistake. And they're like, Hey, you took my hard earned money and I didn't get what you promised me. And, you know, rightfully so they're disappointed with that, you know? Um, that's always a challenge as a restaurant owner, restaurant worker is making sure that you're able to make a hundred people happy a hundred percent of the time. And that's not always good, the case. It's know? hard. It's hard. Well, you've got great people and the pe it's, it's people, man. It is a people business, isn't it? I mean, you, you got to get the food, you got to get the army, all that stuff, but those people can make such a big difference to your point. Just, uh, the extra eye contact the smile the you know my, my daughter had this job this summer as a hostess and i was like every time somebody leaves just look them in the eye and say hey thank you all so much for coming in like it, yeah. it, it, you won't you won't notice it because you're the hostess and you're there but i'm telling you that stuff matters and then they they think the next time they go out they're like man they treated me really well that people just want to be treated well right i mean most people if you treat them well you're kind to them you're attentive you're present um that's that's what hospitality really is right like it's yeah. it's a, yeah. like you said it's a relationship it's not a customer it's a guest in your home and of course if you're in your home you're super attentive and if trying to get people to work for you to understand that is challenging, but you lead by example and they, you know, the right people start to mirror that and get that and realize that like, well, if we do that, you know, it, again, it's like this, it's the byproduct, right? Like treat people really well. They'll come back. The business will be successful. I'll make more money, but that's not, that's not the goal. The goal, you know, that's the byproduct, you know, like that's the, that's what happens if we do the right thing. 
um, which you see. Well, like fully yeah, well, embraced. everyone thinks everyone thinks restaurant owners make a lot of money, but we don't these days. I'll tell you that. No, nah, man, <laughs> it is hard now, man. It's all you know, like you just you you have to constantly. It's so much about managing the business now. It's so much about managing costs. It's making sure that you're cutting people as not too early that you get caught and and burned but you can't keep somebody on because that you know that extra five ten dollars per employee adds up every day it's a hundred dollars a day of of unnecessary labor which is now thirty six thousand five hundred dollars a year that you could have saved by cutting somewhere you know maybe in our heyday that didn't quite i mean it was you know obviously we're not none of us are getting rich unless you're you know owning tons and tons of places but you make a good living now it's you got to fight for every single penny you got to make sure like right now i'm negotiating with new beef purveyors i'm negotiating with bread purveyors i'm gonna go because i can't i can't all i can't raise my prices anymore you know, like you, you, there's a ceiling on that. And so you got to make sure your costs don't outgrow your prices, right? Uh, and so it's, it's a battle. And that's where, you know, that's what my management team now is there. It's not just about the hospitality for them anymore. It's also about learning how to run a business because they do run my business for me. Um, you know, so there's there's so many more. They were always there, but we just have less room for error now. You know, where before you had a little bit of room for error. Now, now you don't. Now, if you want to survive in this industry, you got to be a very, very smart businessman. Um, you know, and and almost ruthless. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but in a way that you protect yourself and you protect your people. Because if you can't make a profit, well, none of these people have jobs, right? So you got to make sure that that you're always sitting with people you're always questioning what's the next thing what's what's the next question i should be asking to make sure that i'm getting the best deal possible in every way um you know so it's like yeah relationships are huge staff is huge but profitability is also huge so you know let's not take that away from why we're doing this i love people i love the industry but I also need to make a living and uh you know that's number one if this restaurant isn't profitable none of us have jobs right so you know i think a lot of times people don't want to talk about that aspect of it you know they're like oh this is i'm into this because of the passion and the love it's like i agree with that but if you're not making money then you're not going to have a whole lot of passion for what you're doing um so you know the business side of it is is something that everybody needs to learn as well um you know it's harder i feel like for you know my chef friends that go into business because they run they're they're artists man you know they're incredible they're talented and they they work with food and they but then all of a sudden they go into a restaurant and they don't have that management team with them and they have to manage books and reservation systems and schedules and all these things and it's like wait i just want to cook man you know that's what i hear from so many of them all the time like me i was a front of house guy i'm not i'm not talented enough to be a chef those guys are are a different breed um you know i'm, I'm i've always been a front of house guy so the business side of it comes easier to me, um, but it's not easy. It's not these days. You're having to really sharpen your skills. The good, the good thing is that just makes you better. And this has forced a lot of restaurants to be, to be better at running the restaurant or a lot of restaurant people that is. It's forced y'all to be better at running it, be creative, come up with new ways to create revenue. And then, you know, economies are cyclical. So at some point, you know, just like after 2008, things will get good again. And then you're just going to be even, you know, you know, you'd just be in much better shape going into that, um, yep. to, to increase profits, um, and to, to thrive. So, um, dude, Tom, what a, what an inspiring story, man. I, I, I had no idea what I was getting into today. I, this is really, really cool. And, I congratulate you. you. I, I tip my hat Thank to you. you. Um, and just phenomenal life that you've built and just well done building a family. Uh, 
and building a successful business and giving so much to your community and to your team and to your guests. And man, I just, I appreciate you. Thank you for the business. Appreciate you as a customer yes. um, and appreciate you taking the cool. time to do this. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, I also appreciate you giving restaurant owners a voice, you know, uh, like I said, people sometimes forget that there are, you know, families and, and, human beings behind the business uh and having an opportunity to talk like this is great so thank you for that well get uh subscribe to the podcast restaurant airs and cork start listening spread the word tell your restaurant buddies and uh we'll just we'll keep trying to crank out good content thank you will i appreciate you